Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Leon Panetta, who has a long and distinguished career in public service. He was a U.S. representative from California's 16th District, now the 17th, from 1977 to 1993. From 1989 to 1993, he was chairman of the House Budget Committee. After serving eight terms in Congress, in 1993, he became director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Clinton administration. In that position, he was instrumental in negotiating the 1993 budget package that is widely credited with putting the federal budget on its path to balancing. Mr. Panetta then served as Chief of Staff to the President of the United States from July 17, 1994 till January 10, 1997. Among his many achievements in Congress was the establishment of the Monterey Bay National Maritime Sanctuary. Today, Mr. Panetta with his wife Sylvia is co-director of the Leon and Sylvia Panetta Panetta Institute for Public Policy based at California State University, Monterey Bay, which he was instrumental in founding. Uh, Mr. Panetta, welcome to Berkeley. Nice to be with you. Where were you born and raised? Born and raised in the district that uh, I had the honor to represent. I was born in Monterey uh, and uh, raised largely in the Monterey area, went to schools in the, in the Monterey area. And where, uh, you went to Monterey High School, right? Went to Monterey High School. I, I started off in Catholic grammar schools. I went to uh, San Carlos uh, Grammar School in Monterey and then went over to the Mission, Carmel Mission School. Uh, but then went over to Monterey High School uh, and uh, to a public high school and uh, then from there went to Santa Clara. And, and did you get involved in student government when you were in high school? Or was that later? No, actually, uh, I think that uh, people often ask me what was my inspiration to, you know, to start to get involved in public service. And I would track it back to student activities in high school. I, I mean, I, I got involved uh, in my class, uh, wor you know, uh, working as a class officer. Mm -hmm. But then I was elected vice president of the student body when I was mm -hmm. a junior. And I was elected president of the student body when I was a senior. And I enjoyed those responsibilities. And I think, uh, I, I think having participated in student politics kind of planted a seed for interest in, in future politics. And, and how did your parents shape your character, you think? Great deal. They were Italian immigrants. And you know, like many immigrants, came here with uh, very little education, uh, not a lot of skills. I didn't speak the language that well. Uh, my father had come in the 20s after World War I, uh, worked in California, had some brothers here, went back, married my mother, came back in the early 30s. And um, they, they were people who believed, obviously, in working hard. Uh, so they gave me a work ethic. Uh, they were people that had a high sense of, uh, of honesty. And they passed it on to me that it was important to always be honest with people. Uh, and they gave me a kind of sense of right and wrong. Uh, you know, it wasn't just them, it was also you know, my Catholic education, but, uh, and later on my Jesuit education. But I think they gave me the kind of fundamental values that are, were probably a hell of a lot more important in politics than a lot of the other things I learned. And, and uh, did, did they own a winery? Is that correct? Or what, what? No, my father uh, and mother first, uh, they, they were working in, uh, in a restaurant, then opened up their own restaurant in uh, Monterey. Mm -hmm. And my earliest recollections were uh, actually uh, washing glasses. I, was, I think it was about, you know, maybe five, six, seven years old, mm -hmm. and washing glasses in the back of that restaurant. Uh, and then <clears throat> they sold the restaurant after the war. Mm -hmm and bought uh, this place in Carmel Valley, which is our family farm and where we now live. Mm -hmm. And my, my father, I think, was always interested in getting back to his roots, uh, you know, from, from his own heritage in Italy. And so we really then worked this 12-acre uh, walnut farm in Carmel Valley, and fortunately it's where my wife and I now make our home. Uh, when you were young, do you recall any books that you read that influenced you? Well, uh, I was always interested in, um, you know, in, in trying to learn about people, and and so as a result, 
you know, some of the things I first started reading were from people who were from the area of Monterey. So Steinbeck interested mm -hmm. me a great deal. So I read a lot of Steinbeck. I read uh, East of Eden, and I read uh, The Red Pony um, and Cannery Row. And, uh, so, and I enjoyed that. And then I, I used to read uh, kind of uh, uh, almost, uh, I guess what you'd call them. It, 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 they're probably little known these days, and you can probably get them on the internet. But there was a Dave Dawson series <laughs> that I used to read about his experiences in the war. Mm -hmm. And it was Dave Dawson is in Britain, Dave Dawson lands on Normandy, Dave Dawson. And I really, and, and it was interesting that that series kind of tracked the history of World War II. Uh, mm -hmm. But it all go, also gave me a sense of, uh, of what it took to, uh, to be involved, not only in the military, but in almost in, in the politics of military policy. Uh, were, were, were you aware when you were reading Steinbeck that he actually was from your part of the country? Yes. Yeah. We always knew that, uh, I always was aware that Steinbeck was from that area. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, there are other authors that come from there. Uh, obviously, Robert Louis Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. used to settle there, yeah. and Treasure Island was another book that mm -hmm. I read. Uh, but we were always aware, particularly with Cannery Row, uh, and you know, the fishing industry was really what made Monterey, uh, at the beginning, it was, uh, it, it, it was largely a, a, a town where Italians came to fish, and part of the fishing industry, and that related an awful lot to what Steinbeck wrote about. And so I, I became interested in that early on. Any mentors that you recall from that period, either uh, teachers or family members, or uh... well, there was a there was a a teacher whose name was uh, Mr. Watkins, who actually was very interested in Steinbeck's. Probably would turn me on to Steinbeck because mm -hmm. he act, after uh, Steinbeck died, he helped establish and protect uh, one of the uh, areas in Cannery Row. Uh, that uh, that Steinbeck used to go to, and actually, I think, lived in Steinbeck's home on Cannery Row, hmm. um, and always used to talk about that. But he was a guy who uh, taught me. I guess it was called. Uh, it, it was it was like problems in democracy. That was it. Problems mm -hmm. in democracy. It was a it was a course in which you learned about politics, and uh, he was a great influence because he. he he always presented a balanced approach. He, mm -hmm. You know, he never went well off one way or the other way, but he kind of presented the picture, and he did it very well. And he, and he also got us interested in current events, uh, because you know, to get involved in politics, you have to be involved in current events. And he did that. He did that through, you know, passing around Time magazine, uh, passing around Life magazine, uh, showing some of the uh, clips and movies from uh, from politics and. I'd, I'd have to say he, 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 was a, he was a great influence in my life. Were your, I, I assume your parents were really pleased to see you go on to college and then to law school? Well, you know, it, it, they had fought most of their life for security. Security for their family, security uh, that they didn't really know in their own home country. And I think they wanted, uh, they wanted both of their sons to have a secure life. That's what, uh, I, I, I honestly believe that what drives a lot of the immigrants who came to this country is not so much improving their lives, but making sure that their children have a better life. And I really think that's kind of the fundamental American dream, which is you know improving the lives of your children. So they always wanted us to have a better life. And so as a consequence, my father thought, that a better profession would be if I became a doctor or, you know, in the very least a dentist because he always felt that was a secure way <laughs> to make a living. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't recall him ever saying getting involved in politics. I think he was proud of the fact I got involved in politics. But his preference was that I be a lawyer. And frankly, my mother's preference was I played the piano. I played uh, concert piano. Hmm. And so she was interested in my becoming a concert pianist and always encouraged me to do that because she thought that's what I ought to do. So I rejected both and uh, I, I kind of followed in my brother's footsteps. He became a lawyer. And I thought by becoming a lawyer, 
that would give me the opportunity to look at a lot of other opportunities. So that's what I did. And so you, sorry. No, there was nobody, there was nobody in our family, obviously, obviously. who was a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so it was really more, you know, because we were sons of immigrants mm -hmm. who, who had come here. But my brother decided to become a lawyer and uh, I think I decided as a result, uh, yeah, I'd follow in those steps for, at least for now. And, and has, uh, you became a lawyer, and, and did the skills you developed at law school help you for what, what you did down the road in all of these positions in Washington? Oh, I don't think there's any question. I, 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 I believe that the fundamental purpose of education is to give you a process of thinking. To, it's not, you know, the dates and the facts that you learn so much as the process of thinking as you approach challenges and problems in society. And legal thinking, uh, the whole process of analyzing a case, a factual situation, looking at both sides, looking at what the facts are, looking at what the legal arguments are, looking at what applies in the situation, and then the capacity to argue a position for or against uh, something based on what you can determine are the facts and the law. Mm -hmm. That process, I think, is invaluable in politics. And I, it's probably what attracts a lot of lawyers to politics, because politics, and certainly legislating, is the process of looking at a situation, determining what course you take, determining what the arguments are for or against it, and then making those arguments. And then in the end, coming up with a settlement that, that establishes a, a, a new variation on the rules about how we will live together. That's right. And then resolving that issue, because in trials you resolve issues, in law you resolve issues, and in politics, hopefully, you resolve issues so that you can try to find something that solves whatever problem you're confronting. Now, your, your first role in politics is, is as a staff member, or one of your first roles, as a staff manor, member for Senator Thomas Kuchel, who was a, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, a, a liberal Republican from yes. California. Yeah. What did you learn from him? Great deal, a great deal. Um, California, I think, has this, this rich history. Uh, you, you wouldn't know it so much now, but it has this rich history of um, what I would call progressive republicanism. It started with Hiram Johnson, Earl Warren, and Tom Kuchel basically followed in that path. Kuchel was elected to the Senate, or actually selected to the Senate by Earl Warren when Nixon became vice president. And uh, Kuchel was one of these individuals, his parents too were immigrants, and they were hard workers. And he believed deeply in what this country was about. I remember going back as a legislative system. You know, probably first indication that he was a good guy is that, uh, I mean, I had no political connections. I was in the Army uh, mm -hmm. getting out. And I, wa I went back to Washington. Uh, th this is an interesting tale. I, I did not know anybody in Washington. But Joe Califano, who was uh, an assistant to President Johnson, at mm -hmm. the time, was there. And I had read about Joe Califano. So I wrote him and said, uh, I, I, I don't know you. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of you as an Italian. I happen to be Italian. Is there a way for me to get involved in government? And sure enough, he wrote and set up some appointments. So I went back. I was still in the Army. Uh, and decided I would rather, uh, I, I went to Justice Department. I went to the Pentagon. I went to other agencies. But I decided I wanted to go to uh, Capitol Hill. And so I walked into Kuchel's office. They had an opening for a legislative assistant. I didn't know the senator. I didn't hmm. know anybody there. Uh, they looked at my background. He liked the fact that I was a lawyer. He liked the fact that I was, had been in the Army. And he hired me. And he brought me into his office soon after he hired me, and it's something that has always stuck with me throughout my political career. And he said essentially, look, uh, you're going to be subject to a lot of temptation in this town. You're a legislative assistant. They're going to go after you. you know, they'll give you lunches. They'll give you gifts to try to influence me. But the fundamental reason we are here is to serve the public interest of the citizens of California and the nation. And the other thing that you've got to remember is that in the morning, you've got to look at yourself in the mirror. And so you always have to do what's right for the people. I never forgot that. It was, uh, it was a tremendous, he was a tremendous role model for me. 
because he made decisions based on what he thought was right for the people. I mean, he voted for civil rights, he voted for uh, labor uh, protections for people, uh, offended an awful lot of people in his own party, but did it because he thought it was right. Uh and in the end, you actually, uh, did you start as a Republican? Yes, or I what you, yeah, I was when, a Republican when I went to, to work for him. And But then you, later in your career, you decided to go over to the Democratic Party. After you were already a congressman person? No, no. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, a Republican when I worked for uh, Senator Kekul. And then uh, I began to see the changes that were going on in the Republican Party. A fellow named Max Rafferty here in California mm -hmm. ran against uh, Tom Kekul. He was uh, a right-wing Republican, the first of that breed who started coming along. Mm -hmm. And he defeated Kekul in a primary. And then he lost to uh, Alan Cranston in November. Kekul would have clearly won in November. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, that didn't happen. And then, uh, so that was kind of the first problem I saw, uh, is that the Republicans were kind of going after their own uh, if they ex exercised uh, too independent uh, judgment. Then I, I, I was asked to come down and work at the uh, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare as an assistant to uh, Secretary Finch. This was in the Nixon administration. And soon after, I was appointed director of the Office for Civil Rights because I'd worked on civil rights legislation on Capitol Hill for the senator. And at that time, uh, the administration had developed the Southern Strategy, uh, which was a political strategy in which they basically, the president had told people like Strom Thurmond, we're going to go slow on civil rights enforcement because civil rights was so uh, controversial in the South. And here I was, director of the Office for Civil Rights, while that kind of political deal had been made. But I made the judgment, and it probably again was based on the experiences I had with Kekul and my own values. I made the judgment that the law was the law. I was going to enforce the law as director of the Office mm -hmm. for Civil Rights, the South needed to go uh, beyond the dual school system. And ultimately, it cost me my job because I did that. Let me answer yes, your question. I forgot to answer you, your oh, question. Sorry, yeah. The question is, when did I then become a Democrat? Yeah. I have to, after I left the Office for Civil Rights, I went to work uh, for John Lindsay, uh, who was mayor of New York City, also another mm -hmm. liberal Republican. And. Uh, it was when I was in New York City and again continued to see the party beginning to move away from the center. Uh, Spiro Agnew campaigned against uh, uh, Charlie Goodell who was running, was a Republican running for the Senate mm -hmm. and, uh, in New York because he was too liberal. Uh, they were working against civil rights legislation. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, I decided that I would become a Democrat uh, when I was there, this would be in the early 70s, 71. And, uh, and I did it because I thought that the Democrats had a larger tent in which they would respect the views that I had developed as a Republican. Uh, in your distinguished career in government service, you, you've accomplished a lot, and now we can't obviously cover all of that. But, but the big issue that you grappled with, both in the Congress and in the White House, was the budget. Right. And I thought we might uh, talk about that uh, as a way to uh, show us how you applied your values in an institute setting and in the end uh, uh, made a change. Uh, what, what exactly was that horrific problem of the budget which uh, 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 since we now seem to be over that hump in many respects we want to forget about it. Yeah. Tell us about what that problem was. Well the problem fundamentally was one of, uh, of a growing deficit in which uh, it began, you know, uh, uh, probably it began with uh, uh, the Johnson approach that thought we could fight a war and at the same time be able to have uh, guns and butter at the same time. Uh, and he was advancing a lot of programs and the country could not afford that. Uh, and it continued and in the, uh, at the time that I was elected to Congress in 1976, uh, the budget deficit was probably somewhere in the vicinity of maybe 25 to 50 billion dollars. Uh, 
then what happened in uh, the early part of the Reagan administration, when a significant tax cut was enacted, at the same time that defense spending went up, and at the same time that entitlement programs were also expanding in costs, what you had was a growing federal deficit that uh, actually by the end of the 80s approached almost $300 billion. And was we were looking at $500 billion, $600 billion annual deficits. And as you ran these high annual deficits, you added to the national debt. The national debt uh, uh, charges interest on that debt, which mm. the public has to pay. And we were developing huge interest payments. So the consequence of running these high deficits was that, number one, uh, it was using very important resources simply for paying the interest on the debt. And we were passing on that obligation to our children. Secondly, it was depressing the private marketplace because the federal government had to borrow that money to pay its own debts. So it was reducing capital that otherwise would be available for the private sector. And thirdly, interest rates were, were uh, uh, extraordinarily high because obviously the federal government was in competition with other private capital. So for all of those reasons, our economy uh, could not be strong as long as we were running those size deficits. So that was kind of the economic problem that confronted the country. The political problem was that both Democrats and Republicans talked about reducing this deficit but neither wanted an approach to touch their favorite programs. The Republicans said they would balance the budget, but they did not want to raise taxes, and they did not want to cut defense. And the Democrats, on the other hand, said, we want to balance the budget, um, but we don't want to cut domestic programs. We don't want to reduce any entitlement programs. Uh, what we want to do is reduce defense and raise taxes. So the very areas that had to be part of a solution were the areas that both parties staked out as holy territory that couldn't be touched. And that created the dilemma as to how do you reduce the deficit if both sides won't agree. And in your role as uh, chairman of the House Budget Committee, uh, what became your main task? You, you, you obviously identified the problem. Then yeah. how did one, uh, did you go about making the changes, taking the steps that began to convert the people so you got the votes? Well, it was, it was a gradual process of trying to make clear to both sides that uh, there was a very important stake involved here in coming to agreement on some kind of budget package. That for the Republicans who argued fiscal responsibility, that gradually as the Cold War began to diminish, one could make the argument that, wait a minute, we don't need the kind of defense expenditures that you're talking about. We can find some savings in this area. It is not going to jeopardize our national security. Uh, and the other argument was, if you want to cut taxes, and that's what you're interested in as a party, then don't add it to the deficit. Tell us where you're going to find savings to support cutting taxes. That same discipline was applied to the Democrats, which was, you know, for the Democrats, you want to reduce the deficit, you want to balance the budget. You want to protect programs for people, as I do. But if you want to develop new programs, if you want to develop new entitlement benefits, then just tell us how you're going to pay for it. What programs are you going to cut? What taxes are you going to raise? We put that dis discipline actually into the law in the 1990 budget agreement, in which we said it's called the PAYGO principle which basically said, you want a new program, or you want to cut taxes, you want to do anything that adds to the deficit, tell us how you're going to pay for it. And that discipline helped a great deal, because mm -hmm. both sides couldn't come up with ways to pay for their favorite programs. Secondly, we put on uh, what are called caps on discretionary spending, where we said we're going to set a level on discretionary spending. Discretionary spending is both defense and domestic. Uh, and so we set a level that said you cannot go above that. And if you go above that, 
then we're going to cut everything across the board. That discipline was also put into place in the 1990 agreement. And people began to abide by that as well. So those two disciplines basically helped us a great deal in establishing the fundamental framework for being able to, uh, to balance the budget. The other thing that happened was that, in, I, I remember when I sat down with, uh, uh, with President-elect Clinton in Arkansas, uh, when he was talking to me about the budget and I guess probably checking me out to see if I was willing to become director of the Office of Management and Budget. And we talked a long time about the deficit and frankly the, the campaign in 92 with Ross Perot had made the deficit a major issue of that campaign, which helped a great deal mm -hmm. ultimately in trying to confront it because the American people became very convinced that this had to be dealt with. But the other reason I, I, I talked to the president at that time, the president-elect, and said, you know, let me tell you what I, four years earlier, had told President-elect Bush, which is that if you don't confront this deficit issue, it will eat you alive. It will take away any resources that you want to do the things you want to do to establish your legacy as president. And so they, I mean, President-elect Clinton got this real fast. He said, if I don't deal with this issue, I'm going to have nothing available to deal with education or the environment or research and development or all of the areas that I care about in this society. And I think that perhaps more than anything convinced him that he would have to take on this issue. And that, that was an important step. As, you, as uh, you talk about this process in the context of our discussion about the values you acquired back in Monterey, uh, I hear some of that resonating basically because uh, it sounds to me like you had the tough job of pointing out that the party had to come to an end in terms of That's its right. profligate, uh, right. uh, profligate spending. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that, and I guess uh, it, it comes from a couple areas. One. Uh, Edmund Burke uh, uh, made the point when he was uh, uh, when he was in Parliament that people elected him to exercise his conscience, uh, and that if he betrayed his conscience, he betrayed his people. And I'm a believer in that philosophy. I think people elect you to exercise your conscience as to what you think is right or wrong. Uh, secondly. I thought that if you're going to exercise leadership, in, and leadership is what our system of government is all about. I mean, our forefathers created this magnificent system of three separate but equal branches of government. But it's a perfect formula for gridlock, unless you've got people who are willing to lead. They believed that that leadership would be there. They believed in uh, that a wise and virtuous people would elect vi wise and virtuous leaders. But leadership demands risks. Mm. And I think one of the problems in politics today is that leaders don't want to take those risks. And I had learned, at least through my, you know, what I had seen my family go through, what I had seen other people who had, you know, whether it's in war or whether it's in, uh, in politics, that leadership demands that you take those risks. And so I guess having those values developed for me, both, both in the Army and with my parents, uh, it gave me the courage to try to confront the deficit issue. Uh, you had the opportunity to, uh, as we used to say in the 60s, see it from both sides now, basically. You, you, you worked hard at this process in the Congress, and then you moved over to the Clinton administration uh, as head of OMB. Uh, what, what are the differences? What, what, what did you learn uh, about this problem that you saw differently once you were in one place and once in the other? Did you see the problem clearer in one place? Were you able to deal with it better in another place? It's a big question, and it involves the whole uh, issue of uh, you know, what, what constitutes power in the executive branch, what constitutes power in the congressional branch, or the legislative branch. Uh, in the legislative branch, uh, 
when you've got 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, uh, power by its very nature is dispersed. There is no centralized power there. Everybody, um, through their own ego and through their own uh, uh, representation, makes decisions based on, uh, on what they, they think uh, is right or wrong. Uh, when the Congress came to the budget process, when they first passed the, the budget resolution, they passed it not because they cared about establishing a budget process or budget discipline. They cared because they, they felt that in trying to limit President Nixon's impoundment authority, which is really the purpose of that law, it's called the Budget and Impoundment Act. This was where the president could choose not to spend money. That's right. The president could basically impound money and choose not to spend it. Well, the Congress uh, resented that. And Nixon tried to do that. And so they tried to then limit his ability to impound money. But they thought, how can we limit the president's ability to impound? Because he's arguing, look, these, these guys are out of control. I'm the only power here that can try to save money for the people. So the Congress felt the only way we could pass a restriction of the president's ability to impound is to discipline ourselves in a budget process. So that's why they passed it. They were never really that committed to the budget process because I mean, the institution was basically one in which everybody brought home you know, uh, pork to their district. They were able to spend money. That was the nature of the appropriations process, was to spend money. And so it was counter everything that they wanted to do. So a challenge for a chairman of a budget committee is how do you take a system in which, which their basic nature is to try to take money and spend it and then try to discipline it. The only way you can do that is if you show that the politics of the country is against them and that ultimately they've got to do something to deal with that. So that's, that's how you deal with that. Not easy. The other approach is to try, I mean there, are some good, there were some good chairmen who felt that it was in the national interest to do the right thing, and, and it was easier to work with them. But there was other, other chairmen that you had to show them mm -hmm. that politics was against them. And you're referring to chairman of other committees. Chairman yeah, of other committees. committees. Yeah. You had to show them that it was against them and that they had to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And frankly, what happened was I began to win votes. Mm -hmm. And when you win votes on budget discipline, then that more than anything convinces people that they've got to come along or they're going to lose their own programs. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one approach in the, on the Hill, which is basically a kind of hard-nosed legislative, uh, you know, do you have the votes or don't you have the votes mm -hmm. kind of approach. The executive branch, it's very different. It is centralized power in the executive branch. The president makes the decisions. When we developed the budget plan, and this was, I mean, I, you know, tell you, talk about the differences between working on the Hill where you had to work every chairman, work every member, work mm -hmm. all of the votes you needed. There, we sat in the Roosevelt Room with the President of the United States, the Secretary of the Treasury, the economic advisor, a few other advisors, and we developed the budget. Mm -hmm. And that budget applied to every cabinet member. I mean, the cabinet members really didn't even have that much play with the budget. We developed the budget there in the Roosevelt Room. We said, this is the President's budget, and this is what you will do. So the process in the executive branch is much more centralized in terms of power. Now, you still have to take those decisions and then take them to Capitol Hill and ultimately win those battles. But internally, in terms of the executive branch, it is a much, much more uh, efficient way to budget than on Capitol Hill. But what you're describing uh, during this early phase of the Clinton administration really required uh, on the one hand, courage, basically, because in a way, when you we say you're telling your cabinet officers uh, to cut back, uh, you're you're talking about the potential voters for the Democratic sure. Party. Sure. Sure. So, so tell us a little about that. I mean, it, it's a. It was. A, was it. Was it surprising that that uh, that such a tremendous act of of courage was taken, or was it just the nature of the situation? I, I think that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons I decided to become director of the Office of Management and Budget is because, you know, I knew as chairman of the Budget Committee I could continue this process of, you know, kind of fighting the executive branch and ultimately, you know, moving step by step to try to reduce the deficit. But I was convinced in the discussions I had with the president that he was committed to taking this on. Now, President Clinton is no political slouch. You know, he was concerned about the politics 
of doing this. The, and, and he understood the price that could be paid. He understood that if you take on uh, programs like you know Medicare or Medicaid or if you raise taxes, that there's going to be a political price that's going to have to be paid. Uh, and he worried about that. He worried about that. But at the same time, he also knew that if he took those steps, and if it resulted in a strong economy, and if it produced more resources for, for him to be able to do the kinds of things he wanted to do to help uh, families in this country, that it would be worth it. And so the dilemma was, uh, can I reverse this process in the economy fast enough so I don't have to pay a heavy political price. He was willing to take that gamble. And it was a gamble. He was willing to take that risk. I think he was convinced because the economic team was so unified on this, saying to the president, you've got to take this issue on. You've got to make these decisions it's for the sake of the country. And he believed that, and I think he, he believed that that was the right thing to do. But his, the political side of him always wondered whether or not he would pay a heavy price. And as it turned out, he did pay a heavy price. I mean, I think he always considered that one of the reasons he lost a Democratic Congress in 94, uh, along with other issues, health care and gun control, mm -hmm. well, one of the issues was the vote on the budget and the fact that this was a very tough vote for members. We only won it by one vote in the House. We won it with the vice president's vote in mm -hmm. the Senate. So it was a very close vote. What? And, uh, and, and I think, you know, the president always was convinced that he had paid a political price, but that he had done the right thing. One of the dilemmas and problems of our democracy today is this, uh, the relationship of leadership to the people. And from the outside, one has a sense of a fear of leading. Uh, a, a, uh, an impulse to consult the polls rather than to lead the polls. Uh, share with us your reflections on that analysis. Well, it's been an interesting transition that I've seen. I mean, in the 30 years I've been in and out of Washington, uh, I've seen a transition. Uh, because I, I can remember when I first went back as a legislative assistant to uh, Senator Kekel, uh, some of the people in the United States Senate were people like uh, on the Republican side, uh, Jacob Javits from New York, Clifford Case from New Jersey, uh, Ed Brooks from Massachusetts, uh, Sherman Cooper from Kentucky, Hugh Scott from Pennsylvania, Everett Dirksen. On the Democratic side, people like Jackson and Magnuson, Dick Russell, Fulbright, Sam Irvin. These were giants. And yes, they played politics, and yes, they, you know, they, they had their political differences. But when issues of national interest came to play, they were willing to resolve those issues in the national interest. What's happened in the interim? I think there are several factors. One is just the revolution in the information age. That information travels so fast right now. And there are so many vehicles to send that information to the American people, whether it's the internet, whether it's cable networks. You know, there, somebody told me that out of 90 cable networks in uh, New York, there are 30 that are uh, kind of 24-hour uh, news stations of one kind or another. So they're all searching for that immediate news, that hit piece. And what that does is it's created an incentive to go after the 30-second soundbite that you can literally destroy an opponent or an opposition party simply through a soundbite that attacks that person at a vulnerability. And so the incentive is rather than sitting down and rolling up your sleeves and working on the tough issues that, that, uh, that you face for the country, the political incentive is why do I have to do that when I can literally maintain my power, strengthen my power, simply by destroying my opponent with a 30-second soundbite. That's produced the consultants, that's produced the pollsters that now shape those messages, and that's produced this huge race for money, which dominates the political process today. So it's all of those factors that I think then contribute to what is the worst situation, which is that the leaders of the country then don't want to take the risks that will in any way challenge their power. So what's the way out of that dilemma? 
it, it comes, I think, one of two ways. One is that the people themselves decide enough is enough. Now, part of the problem right now is the public, to some extent, is turned off by what they see in Washington. Mm -hmm. That the reality is that uh, when only a third of the public shows up to vote, uh, it tells you that the people have decided for whatever reason that they don't want to participate in our system. And if they aren't there to participate, if that wide group in the middle doesn't want to participate in the political process, then the extremes will. And they begin to dominate what happens, and it becomes really a, almost a special interest battle that goes on. If the public rises up and says enough is enough, and either votes people out of office or votes people into office because they're willing to exercise that kind of leadership, then I think that is one way to change the process. The other is, is that there are role models who develop, who decide that they're willing to take that risk. And even though they may lose their office or they may lose their election, that they establish a principle in which people then suddenly say, wait a minute, what that individual did was right. And either young people and others look to that individual and say, he or she did the right thing. We have role models in sports. We have role models in entertainment. We need to have better role models in politics. And what do you, what do you, what do you see as the role of the press in bringing civility back, uh, which is partly what you're talking about? Well, that's, it, it plays a very important role in this because it relates to that, uh, it relates to that whole information age technology that I talked about. Because as, as news flies faster, as there are uh, develop more competitive vehicles for that news, what happens is is that uh, the news agencies themselves, rather than focusing on legitimate news, uh, are trying to focus then on tabloid news because it's juicier and because you know they, they figure they can draw a bigger audience by by using that. So what happens is is that the press then caters to the sound bites. It caters to every issue then becomes who's a winner and who's a loser. Not what's involved here, not what the substance of an issue is, but who won, who lost, you know, where is the scandal, where is the, uh, you know, the, the investigation. Uh, they're looking at kind of the underside of politics because that's where the juicy stories are. And they're missing the bigger picture. And so people in politics then say, you know, why should I work on this issue when I get, when I, when the press doesn't care about it? They care more about whether or not, you know, I can destroy somebody with a personal attack. So the press has a very large responsibility here. And, you know, to a large extent, if they are willing to say, look, we're not going to pay attention to your th sound bite. What we care about is what's the substance of this issue. Uh, and they begin to not pay attention to that then that, too, will have a significant impact on the kind of change we need in our leadership. Uh, on, uh, on the one hand, we have this extraordinary story uh, that you just told about the budget process and how we moved back from the brink and the system worked. On the other hand, in this recent period, we have the legacy of, of the impeachment process, which if, if the first is the West case law book of how democracy should work, then uh, the second is the star tabloid, uh, you know, That's coming right. home. And what, what I'm, I'm curious about is what do you think will be the long-term impact of both of these processes. In other words, will one prevail in our consciousness so we can look back on this recent period and say, hey, the process really worked? Or will the damage done by the impeachment process uh, to the executive and to the popular perception be too great to make the first impossible? I, the answer to that question lies in whether you're looking at the short term or the long term. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the long term, I don't think there's any question but that the leadership that uh, was at play in developing the budget plan and putting it in place <clears throat> and the courage that it took to put that in place uh, and what it produced in terms of our economy is, you know, I, I think frankly it's, it's the fundamental legacy of this administration and I think it's what drives 
you know, uh, the American system right now is the fact that our democracy worked to confront an economic issue, dealt with it, and put this country on the right track. That, that's what our forefathers had in mind, and that's when our process works best. The impeachment in the short term basically feeds into a lot of the problems that I talked about in which people are becoming increasingly skeptical about whether the system can really work to confront problems. I mean, it was, and it was always my view. I mean, I, impeachment was, uh, probably everybody got struck by this, but I, I, I continued to wait during the impeachment process for someone, somewhere to rise to the occasion. That in the past, when we confronted these kinds of issues, there was always somebody, somewhere, who rose to the issue. You mean, for example, like a Sam Irwin? A yeah. Sam Irwin, yeah. or a Howard Baker, or a Peter Rodino, who says, this is the right thing to do and was not interested in the political games, but interested in what was the right thing to do. And it never happened. It obviously didn't happen. I mean, uh, the president himself uh, you know, could have spoken very directly on this issue and probably put it aside. He didn't do it. Uh, the independent consul could have done it uh, with some credibility, and that didn't happen. Uh, the, the House of Representatives and Judiciary Committee could have done it. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Nobody rose to the occasion. And the same thing's true in the Senate. So for the American people, you know, the impeachment process was one that I think uh, almost confirmed for them that uh, that, that process is not working there and, mm -hmm. and did not create confidence in the process. Now, whether that damage, you know, is long-lasting, I mean, we'll see. I tend to think it's not. I tend to think that that uh, the, the great thing about the American people is that they will always be willing to, you know, to find uh, that kind of inner strength to go on. It's the, I think that's the great strength of this country, is that somehow we always find the inner strength, whether it's in our Constitution or our belief in ourselves as people, that we ultimately continue to go on. And I think for that reason, uh, we will go on. And that ultimately, uh, the greater lesson here will be the lesson that came out of the economic process and not the one out of impeachment. Uh, students looking at this tape, I mean, it, look, it, it, they must be seeing a case study in what the Founding Fathers hoped for our, uh, however imperfect, system of government. What lessons would you have them uh, draw uh, from uh, uh, your career uh, in answer to the question, well, why should I go into politics? The, the concern I have right now, and one of the reasons my wife and I started this Institute for Public Policy, is because my concern is that a younger generation doesn't get turned off about getting into politics. Uh, we did a poll a national poll of college students. And it confirmed our worst suspicions, which was that 73% said they would never want to go into a public office or public mm -hmm. career. 66% uh, who were eligible to vote did not vote. 80% said they never had a conversation with an adult about whether or not to go into Gee. a public office. 80%. Hmm. Yet at the same time, the poll also showed that 75% believed in volunteering for community service at the local level. Which tells me that despite all of their the cynicism about the larger picture, that they really do see the relevance of their involvement at the local level and they can see the differences. If they go into a school, go into health care, go into um, you know, juvenile delinquency, uh, trying to deal with that, or, or conservation or the environment, they see that as relevant. I, I've always, I, our country's strength is based on the fact that people cared for one another as a community and as a family. And if we can develop that inspiration to work at the local level, I think ultimately they'll be okay. Because ultimately they'll learn that these larger policies at the federal level do indeed affect what happens in every family. 
And, and this is, is a local manifestation of what we're seeing in international affairs, which is that non-governmental organizations are taking on a That's leadership right. role. That's right. I mean, if, 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 you know, if the Congress doesn't want to provide money for this or that, or the UN has a hard time finding money for this or that, mm -hmm. then what you're going to see develop are organizations that are going to confront these issues. And I think that's healthy. It's healthy until we understand that, uh, you know, ultimately uh, it is those people we elect who should make these decisions. I mean, I, I do think that there's a danger in this, too. I mean, I, I, California is a good example of it. I think the initiative process in California uh, is a little bit out of control because people, what happens in the state is that people decided that if the legislature doesn't want to confront these issues, then we'll deal with it. And so now it's, be, but, but what's happened is it's become a game for those with money and power to basically play the initiative game. I think that undermines our republic when that happens. And if we go to national initiatives, they're talking about that, I think that'll uh, undermine it as well. I think ultimately we do have to return to representative government. But to do that, representatives are going to have to show that, that they have the courage and the leadership to lead. In, in retelling your story, the, the, this issue of values and values manifesting themselves in the individual, because it's really what, what, per, what hits one every once in a while. It is processes, it is institutions, but it's really individuals right. uh, uh, who, who are willing to take on the challenge and confront the issues. I don't th there, there is no question in my mind that uh, it's the difference between what you learn in a political science class and what you learn when you actually go out and deal with these issues, either in the legislative context or the executive context, that ultimately it really does depend on the quality of people that are there. And if they have the right values, you know, even if they make the wrong decisions, if they have the right values, ultimately our process will continue to work because it's based on what's right and what's wrong. And I think that that is the ingredient, and unfortunately, it's not something that you can teach in a classroom. You know, your parents give it to you, the way you're raised gives it to you, the, the role models that you see in society gives it to you. But it is those kind of fundamental values that I think ultimately determine whether our process works or not, because this is a human process. It's a government of, by, and for people. Looking at your career, you started in Monterey, and, and you've actually now come back uh, to Monterey. And, and I noticed in looking at your Vita, two achievements that must uh, give you great satisfaction. Uh, one is the establishment of the Monterey uh, National Park to preserve uh, the seashore on the one hand, and on the other is being instrumental in having the military base where I believe I was told you served actually when you were in the uh, military, uh, Fort Erward, uh, converted uh, into uh, the campus for California State University at Monterey Bay. Tell us about uh, uh, those two uh, distinctive coming homes, so to speak, first. <laughs> Leon Panetta, local boy, <laughs> turned national politician, turned uh, a citizen of Monterey. Well, it, it's, you know, it's the ultimate satisfaction of what you can do in the political process if you can, in fact, either improve or protect the quality of life where you come from, where you're raised, your home. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of satisfactions in elective office. Uh, the satisfactions of helping people find a social security check or a veteran's benefit uh, and try to provide that kind of assistance is very satisfying. But the greatest satisfaction is when you can actually take on a, a major challenge in your area and do something that, that is lasting, that really then provides something not only for yourselves but for your children and their children. Uh, Monterey Bay uh, Sanctuary is, is, was one of those battles. And it began actually because Secretary Watt in the Reagan administration decided he wanted to do offshore drilling off the oh, entire gee. California coast. And his approach was, let, you know, let's put everything up on the auction block. And I mean, I, I remember going to him. I remember trying the approach of basically trying to convince him, well, well wait a minute. I, I realize that you want, you know, there are oil resources there. But look at the Big Sur coast. 
And look at the Monterey Bay. I mean, these are unique resources. You know, look at the Mendocino Coast. Look at some of these other areas. These are unique resources. I mean, you're head of the Interior Department. These resources ought to be protected for people in the future. You know, we can decide perhaps there are still some areas, as we do in, in the uh, Gulf, you know, where drilling can take place. He wouldn't buy that. And I could never work out an agreement with him. So I started passing moratoriums on offshore drilling. And the yeah. Congress was with me. They stopped him. Hmm. But eventually I said, well, I can't keep passing moratoriums. I want to protect this area for the future permanently. And so that's when I developed the Monterey Bay uh, Sanctuary approach and uh, finally got that passed. And, and, and I'm very proud of that because it does protect the bay and that coastline for the future. Uh, Fort Ord was a different experience. Fort Ord, uh, you know, we, we kind of relished having a diverse economy. And suddenly one part of that economy was taken away. Almost 25% of our economy depended on Fort Ord. In Monterey. In yeah, Monterey. Yeah. I said, hey, we had the 7th Division. Uh, the businesses that had developed around that military base, uh, you know, it, was, it represented 25% of the local economy. Uh, what do you do? How do you replace that? Uh, and so we developed a coalition. Uh, I, I, I talk about bringing people of diverse views into a room. Well, that's what I did. We, we had a lot of local leaders sat in that room. And we ultimately decided that putting a university there made the best sense. And thankfully, uh, the California State University system and the chancellor agreed at the time, Barry Muniz, that this was a good opportunity. And so we were able to establish that campus, and it became the centerpiece for the reuse of the military base and probably became the best example to the country of how you can take uh, uh, guns and convert them into plowshares. One final question. In all of this, uh, your family has been an important part uh, of uh, your political uh, life. Uh, and now your institute is, is named the Leon and Sylvia Panetta. Yes. Tell, tell us about that support that you got from your family in all of these endeavors. Well, <laughs> there is no way, there is no way that uh, uh, I could have uh, in any way achieved what I did in the political sphere without uh, that kind of support system. It just, you know, and, and, and you see it happen almost every day. There are those that make a choice that politics is more important than their family, and as a result, it creates tremendous problems with regards to their children and their family. The best thing that happened to us is that uh, from the very beginning, when I first ran for office, my wife became a real partner in this process. She helped run my campaigns. Uh, she ran my offices in the district on a volunteer basis because you couldn't pay your wife. But she ran my offices. I talked to her every day. She knew what was going on. <clears throat> she, when people talked to her, they knew they were talking to me. And at the same time, what I would do is I would fly back and forth from Washington every weekend uh, to get back to my home. Because I made the decision that Washington was where I worked, but my home was going to be in the Monterey area and in Carmel Valley. And so I, I would come home every, every week. I mean, I put a lot of mileage plus up, obviously, by flying back and forth across the country. But it was the right thing to do. And so our kids felt that they had roots in the, in the area. And that was their home. And my wife was working in the district, you know, and at home. Uh, and she continued to support me uh, th throughout that whole process. And it worked for us because our, you know, our sons are now grown. We have three sons. Uh, we have two lawyers and a doctor. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're well on their way. And that's our proudest achievement, very frankly. But more than that, um, my wife has, has really not only provided the love, but provided tremendous support throughout this process. I, you, you could not, we could not have achieved what we did if we didn't do it together. Congressman Panetta, thank you very much uh, for thank taking the time much. to be with uh, us today. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.